Play some damn chess. Okay. All Christians believe that Christ's incarnate work, climactically at his death on the cross, has effected atonement. It has reconciled God and human beings. But how it has done so is a huge source of disagreement, and there's all these different theories or motifs for how this has happened. The Swedish Lutheran theologian Gustav Alain kind of popularized this threefold schema. So he said there's objective accounts of the atonement, such as Anselm's view of satisfaction, which uh, Christ satisfies divine honor through his life and death. Um, so in an objective account, the atonement is primarily with reference to God. There's subjective accounts where it's primarily with reference to human beings, like Abelard's theory of moral influence, God showing his love and influencing humanity. And he said, uh, against that old tired contrast, here's a third way, and he advocated for a Christus Victor model, which uh, has the atonement primarily with reference to Satan and evil and death. And this is where it's very trendy now. People have kind of moved on from Alain, but people do this a lot. They, they want to get beyond Anselm and get beyond the older models. Sometimes they'll say they're going back to the church fathers, but it's very trendy to have a newer kind of Christus Victor model. But if you go beneath that schema from Alain and just look at all the different theories, there's a lot out there. I mean, you've got uh, the ransom theory. Christ liberates us from the provision of Satan. You can see that popularized in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. That's one of the theories of the atonement uh, that's out there. Um, and, and, and that's in that's involved in the Narnia. I have an excursus in my uh, chapter on this topic in my book, which I'll talk about in a second, where I talk about atonement in Narnia, which is a fascinating way of kind of getting into this. Anyway, I'll come back to that. Uh, you've got penal substitution. Christ pays the penalty for our sin. The governmental theory, Christ maintains divine justice. Uh, recapitulation, we'll talk about that a lot here. Christ recapitulated or sort of remade humanity, reversing the work that Adam did, right. and all kinds of others. And I just find this whole area really fascinating. I think it's an interesting area in relation to ecumenical theology, which is something I'm very interested in, because the different views of the atonement relate to some extent to these other historical differences between the different traditions, but then it's also uh, related to progressive versus conservative different instincts about the atonement. And so there's kind of multiple levels at which this conversation is happening. So all that brings up this question that's interesting to me, and that is, what's the best way to put it all together? Is there a kind of lowercase c Catholic, integrative, unifying center of gravity to the doctrine of the atonement. And if you watch my channel, you know part of the ethos of Truth Unites is in a time of disenchantment and deconstruction, trying to uh, be a voice of reconstruction and consolidation and showing a pathway forward for especially for people who are disillusioned. So it's interesting for me in the doctrine of the atonement to, to think about that. What's the way forward here? Is there kind of a core that we can come together around even while we keep kind of debating the, the periphery? And so this video is going to be a constructive proposal for one possible way to envision the essence of the atonement. And I want to draw from Irenaeus's emphasis upon recapitulation and alongside Anselm's emphasis upon satisfaction and suggest that these two can form a kind of framework or baseline from which we can work on further specifications and, and because there is so much to the atonement we need to affirm for example we need to affirm Christus Victor it's right there in Colossians 2 Christ did conquer Satan at the cross uh, we need to affirm moral influence it's right there in Romans 5 um, but both of those and many of the other so called theories or motifs aren't really explaining the actual mechanism by which the reconciliation between God and human beings happen it more is speaking to the result of that. And so um, we can affirm those things, but they're not at the nerve center here. That's where we're going to look at Anselm and, and Irenaeus instead. Within an Anselmian, Irenaean framework, we can also affirm penal substitution. This is a very controversial part of the atonement, and what I want to say about this is that it can be and often is crudely expressed, it can be articulated in a kind of vulgar or simplistic way, and it can be over-centralized, and it often is over-centralized. But 
It shouldn't be denied altogether. Death itself is a penal reality in Genesis 2 and 3. Christ submits to death in a substitutionary way, and an emphasis upon penal substitution, understood accurately, is uh, compatible with Anselm and his focus upon the satisfaction of divine honor. Anselm throughout his book, Curteus Homo, Why the God-Man, where he uh, it's one of his most important book on this topic. He talks about punishment a lot, as well as the satiation of divine honor. So, here's what we'll do. We're going to work through passages in Irenaeus and Anselm, and then I want to incorporate Athanasius as well. He's another key figure in the early church for the atonement, and we're going to be retrieving their, their insights to help us do kind of constructive theology today. And basically what I want to try to show is that the perceived differences between many of these different approaches or these different motifs are not necessarily incompatible. They are not only mutually compatible, they're even mutually explanatory. They fit well together and they have huge overlap. And seeing that I think helps us avoid revisionist accounts of the atonement that want to move away from, a, from an objective focus of the atonement. Um, but also reductionistic accounts of the atonement that over-centralize the cross and uh, miss the kind of broader narrative arc of Christ's incarnate work. We want to get a vision of the whole from Bethlehem to the final trumpet. Okay? And each moment along the way, including his intercessory work for us now, including his entire life, including his burial, it's all important, and we're going to talk about that. Um, at the same time, it's not all equally important, and the cross, and more strictly speaking, the cross and resurrection together are kind of this climactic moment in this larger uh, work that the Son of God has done for us. So we're going to try to get the balance there right between emphasizing what is central, but also incorporating all that is true that Christ does to bring us back to God. So, I'm really excited for this video. It is, it's going to be longer, as long as it is. It will still not be comprehensive. If you want to get a longer version, you can see chapter 6 of uh, my book, Theological Retrieval for Evangelicals. And I go through a lot more there, a lot more quotes, a lot more examples. I, I footnote things and engage with the scholarship more. That's also where I have that excursus on atonement in Narnia, which is really fun to engage with. Um, but uh, here's what we'll do in this video. We'll go through, real quickly, Irenaeus. First, second, Anselm. Third, Athanasius. Just exposit their thought a little bit and show how they're God, I think you in their embassies. Up. And then we'll kind of sum it up and ask, what does this mean? And we'll deal with a fourth section where we'll talk about the transfiguration of Christ. A hugely neglected event that I find fascinating and will it'll be apparent at that point why we're talking about that. And then we'll have some kind of summative concluding remarks. So first... Irenaeus. So the term recapitulation is a key word for Irenaeus. It's all throughout his famous book Against Heresies, and some scholars have suggested that this is kind of the centerpiece to his entire theology. The basic word, uh, both Greek and Latin, means summarizing or repeating. Okay, those are usually the two... Uh, kind of basic concepts involved with this word. By the way, we talk about, and it has more technical meanings in certain contexts, like in music and in speeches and rhetoric, but uh, trying to get the big idea here. By the way, when we talk about Irenaeus, we'll talk about both Greek and Latin because uh, Against Heresies was written in Greek, but then our access to it is mostly through Latin translation as well as through an Armenian translation and some Syriac fragments as well. Now, this, uh, just to cut to the right to it here, the idea of recapitulation is really complicated. There's one Irenaean scholar who talks about 11 different uh, sort of permutations of this motif in his writings. But the basic idea of recapitulation, you can kind of sum it up in three ideas. Uh, Christ restores human nature to immortality through his incarnate work, reversing the effects of Adam's fall. Okay, if you want to distill it down even further, you just say, uh, through his incarnation, Christ restores human nature. He remakes and reconstitutes human nature. Now, the, the basic idea here is that, uh, and, and, and the reason this gets kind of controversial is people, what it's emphasizing then is that the incarnation itself 
is salvific. So, for example, to give some passages and against heresies, he'll talk about Christ's redemption as attaching man to God by his own incarnation and bestowing upon us at his coming immortality durably and truly. You see that verb attaching there. Elsewhere, he writes that Christ caused human nature to cleave to and to become one with God. This is a huge emphasis in Irenaeus' account, is that you have this union in the incarnation between divine nature and human nature. Okay, Christ is fully God and fully man, so there's a union between the human and the divine. So you can think of his, uh, his view of the atonement as this kind of down-up movement. Okay, uh, And that's how it's often summarized. Uh, God becomes man so that man can become God. Now, I know, I'll give a, I'll give a quote of this and then I'll, I'll speak to some of the concerns. Here's, here's an example of where he says that the word of God, our Lord Jesus Christ, did through his transcendent love become what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he himself is, or he is himself. Now, I know that a lot of people, especially evangelicals, really stumble over this. The, first of all, the idea of recapitulation, we're going to come back to that. That's actually a very biblical idea. Even though the word may not be there in Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15, for example, this Adam-Christ typology, we'll talk about that. But the other thing people really worry about is this idea of us becoming God, what people call theosis or divinization. And I just want to allay concerns about that if I can. Just say, be patient to really think this through because that's a very much, not just Eastern idea, it's a Western idea. It's strongly an Augustine. I go through that in my book on Augustine. <laughs> and Calvin's and all over the place. And understood properly. Not as though there's this ontological equivalence between creatures and you God, but book. it's a kind of participation in God. Yeah, that's a, a biblical idea. You can see it in Second Peter 1, 4, for example, which talks about becoming partakers of the divine nature and other passages as well. If you just are a little open-minded about that and think of that through, that really needn't cause the kind of worries that usually instinctively come up. It's a very lowercase c Catholic idea. So... Don't let that freak you out too much here. Let me give another passage here from Irenaeus. Here's where you can see a little longer passage. This will bring out some of the nuances you of his view. Stupid. You can see here his, I, his emphasis upon the logical necessity of recapitulation, why it couldn't have happened any other way. He says, For it was for this end that the word of God was made man, that he who was the Son of God became the Son of Man that man, having been taken into the word and receiving the adoption, might become the Son of God. For by no other means could we have attained to incorruptibility and immortality unless we had been united to incorruptibility and immortality. For, but how could we be joined to incorruptibility and immortality unless, first, incorruptibility and immortality had become that which we also are? so that the corruptible might be swallowed up by incorruptibility and the mortal by immortality that we might receive the adoption of sons. Like so many uh, pre-modern theological quotes. It's just, it's so interesting. It sounds, on surface level, it's more, it's like the book of 1 John in the New Testament. Surface level, it's more lucid. When you start thinking about it, it's really nuanced and interesting. And in this passage, you see a, a lot going on there. You see these two distinct reasons for why the incarnation was necessary for salvation. First, he's saying the only way to become incorruptible and immortal is, is if there's a union between the corruptible and, and incorruptible, the mortal and immortal. And then he says, secondly, the union has to be established on the uh, immortal side. Uh, so the unity it. has to come about and has to come from that direction. And then he also brings in the idea of adoption, which is a big part, often underexplored part of Irenaeus's soteriology, which means doctrine of salvation. So, the big idea for Irenaeus, at Bethlehem, the moment that there's the conception of Jesus Christ in the womb of Mary, the virgin, there is a union. Something new happens that has never happened in all of history. It's the great event in all of created reality, creator, creature, are united in this way. And this has this profound effect that changes the nature of humanity herself.
Okay, it's a really interesting idea. Um, now, so a way to think about this, just another one little other layer here before we move on to Anselm to clarify is that you have to see Irenaeus's view of recapitulation and the atonement in relation to his view of creation. And this is something that's often, I think, neglected today. So this immortality, you know, that, well, how does that come in? This is not just an arbitrary thing that just suddenly comes to the human race through Christ. This is what Adam and Eve would have gotten had they passed the test in the garden, okay? Um, he, t he speaks of this immortality. This is the uh, completion of the image of God. So Irenaeus teaches that because human beings are made in God's image, we will attain to immortality. Uh, Adam and Eve were created innocent, but not fully mature. They were childlike, they were growing, and they would have grown into uh, the full instantiation of the image of God, which would have been immortality. So what happened at Easter would have happened in Genesis 3 had they passed the test, had Adam and Eve not sinned. They would have grown up into immortality to fully reflect the image of God. Here's a passage where you can get some of this. He says, that's when what, that's he what, became that's incarnate, what that's Christ, says. and was made man, he recapitulated in himself the long line of human beings and furnished us in a brief, comprehensive manner with salvation, so that what we had lost in Adam, namely, to be according to the image and likeness of God, that we might recover in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to skip over a lot more quotes where I exposit all of that in greater detail and situate that in relation to the scholarship and just, I'm trying to, this video, kind of summarize some of the main points of what I've argued for because I think this area is so important and maybe this could be of, of interest to people out there. But the, here's the key point, okay? This emphasis upon recapitulation, Christ restores human nature through the Incarnation, is not at odds with an emphasis upon Christ's substitutionary death. They are complementary. In fact, they have a logical relationship. Recapitulation is itself a substitutionary idea. Only one who stands in our place can sum up and restore our nature. And so we'll have lots of passages talking about Christ for us. His passages, you know, where he says Christ had to be an infant for infants, a youth for youths, etc. Implicit in the idea of recapitulation is a notion of substitution, and Irenaeus has a strong emphasis upon Christ's crucifixion as substitutionary. Now, it's true that Irenaeus doesn't emphasize that as much as, as others do, but uh, it's still important for him, and one of the problems is people often neglect his other works. They look just at against heresies. And what I've argued in, in the chapter is that, you know, against heresies takes on its own distinctive flavor because it's written against the Gnostics. So it's not going to give you this full orbed, fully nuanced account of everything that Irenaeus believes. But um, in the early 20th century, there was another major work of Irenaeus's that was discovered in Armenian translation, and it's one of my favorite patristic texts. I wrote a blog post a while back giving five texts to read from the Church Fathers. If you're interested in getting them, the Church Fathers, where do I start? I get asked that all the time. I'm constantly recommending that article as an answer to that question. And this is one of those five. Uh, his, so the work is called On the Apostolic Teaching, and it's a shorter catechetical text. And uh, John Baer calls it the earliest summary of Christian teaching presented in a non-polemical or apologetic manner that we now have. So it's a really significant work, actually. I, I tend to think it's a, you know neglected in terms of its importance. Well, in this work, he's working through all these Old Testament passages, and he's got a, a strong, and you know his full doctrine of the atonement gets a little clearer because alongside the recapitulation theme, which is also still there, he, uh, he's talking about the rests of Christ's incarnate life more as he's talking about it fulfilling Old Testament scripture. And when he gets to Isaiah 53, he's got some strong statements about the way Christ's death on the cross takes away judgment for us. At one point he talks about it as the judgment has been taken away from the believers in him and they are no longer under it. 
one scholar who's working in this area talks about for Irenaeus, the, there's the active and passive dimensions of Christ's obedience, and he talks about the passive dimension as being his submission to the righteous judgment of the righteous Father on the fallen and disobedient flesh and nature which he assumed at the Incarnation, standing in our place for our sake, bearing that judgment and taking it away. Now, I have a lot more to say about Irenaeus and especially his view of the ascension of Christ, which is really important, but let's just keep moving here to try to get the main point out and not get too bogged down. Uh, let's talk about Anselm. So, uh, the kind of question we're asking here is, how might an emphasis upon recapitulation fit harmoniously oh, with an emphasis upon satisfaction? What is satisfaction? This is the idea that Christ's death satisfied the divine honor by uh, paying what was owed to God but was lost through sin. And it's so common in contemporary theology to pit Anselm and Irenaeus against one another, or Anselm, really Anselm against everybody. Anselm is frequently uh, caricatured as this kind of guilt-obsessed, overly juridical, individualistic uh, account of the atonement that we need to get beyond. And I have also linked to another article I wrote defending his atonement theory. I think Anselm is actually very nuanced, and I think he's actually totally harmonious with recapitulation. In fact, not just harmonious, Man, you're fucking I think he up. actually just flat out affirms recapitulation explicitly in, and, and repeatedly in, his major work on this topic, Why the God Man. Let me give some examples. So, um, you know, it's actually amazing to read through that book. It is, it is so contrary to the caricatures. It's about so much more than just the legal dimension and, and of our salvation, and so much more than just uh, Christ's death. You have to actually get a ways into it before you even get to kind of a systematic exposition of Christ's death. So much of that book is about the angels and about human happiness and so many other things. It's, it's uh, exactly the opposite of the caricatures. It's very comprehensive and expansive. But uh, what, you know, early on in the book, he talks a lot about how Christ's incarnation, his, his very becoming man, uh, reconstitutes and restores human nature exact same idea of recapitulation that we see in Irenaeus and as we'll see in Athanasius. For example, Anselm says that at the union of divine and human nature that happens at the incarnation, quote, there was not any degradation of God in his incarnation, rather we believe that human nature was exalted. Later on he says that when Christ assumed a sinless human being, God restored human nature more wonderfully than he first established it. And this is just consistent language all throughout. It sounds a lot like Irenaeus. It sounds a lot like the Adam-Christ typology, this restoration of human nature through the Incarnation. At one point he says, quote, it was fitting that just as death entered the human race through the disobedience of a human being, so too should life be restored by the obedience of a human being. That sounds exactly like what you're going to find in Irenaeus. Irenaeus will say things very similar, such as this. As our species went down to death through a vanquished man, so we may ascend to life again through a victorious one. And uh, Anselm also has the exact same doctrine of creation as Irenaeus. Had Adam and Eve passed the test? Not the exact same. There are differences. I, I don't want to overstate this. Um, he, d he doesn't uh, have quite the same uh, idea of Adam and Eve as childlike, but he does have this basic idea that Adam and Eve would have been translated into what he calls blessed immortality had they passed the test in the Garden of Eden. And because they didn't, the test came, and that's what he did by being born and then by all of his incarnate work. And the explicit yeah, focus throughout Anselm is on his entire incarnate work. And I'm not the only one who reads Anselm and notices he's basically saying recapitulation. Here's how David Bentley Hart puts it. In the end, Anselm merely restates the oldest patristic model of atonement of all. Up. Recapitulation. Now let me just draw this out a little bit further by looking at one other text, and that's well, not just one other text. I'll look at a couple of his uh, books, but uh, one other theologian, and that's Athanasius. I'm fixing because to get some people might be a little more. skeptical thus far and say, okay, maybe this this one statement in uh, Irenaeus kind of sounds like uh, you know Anselm, and Anselm has some statements that sound like Irenaeus, but um, are they really that similar? Well, if you read through Athanasius, who's 
extremely important in these conversations. Sometimes people think of Athanasius as just uh, important because he affirmed the deity of Christ. But uh, Athanasius was a good theologian, very rich and nuanced account of the atonement in multiple places, but especially what we'll look at here, his book on the incarnation. And on, what you see in this slut. book is just this clear combining of recapitulation and satisfaction or something like satisfaction if you don't want to use that exact label but it's really right there it's just basically the same idea let me develop that so on the one hand you've got recapitulation his famous statement very similar to those of Irenaeus about the down up movement God becomes man man becomes God is toward the end of on the incarnation he says the word assumed humanity that we might become God it's often translated a little different I'm using the translation in the popular patristics uh, series so I've looked at the Greek text as well to kind of confirm at a few points especially when it's using sacrificial language for the atonement so this is all over the but let me but the recapitulation idea is, is even clearer in some respects in Athanasius than it was in Irenaeus because he's used these fascinating metaphors so one of the metaphors he uses is of a painting that's been worn out and then is repainted Okay. He says, you know what happens when a portrait that has been painted on a panel becomes obliterated through external stains. The artist does not throw away the panel, but the subject of the por portrait has to sit for it again. And then the likeness is redrawn on the same material. Even so was it with the all-holy Son of God. He, the image of the Father, came and dwelt in our midst in order that he might renew mankind made after himself those words made after himself there and also the word likeness yeah, show athanasius has the same doctrine of creation the image of god being restored that's uh we that we saw with irenaeus and anselm so same same thing in the background and we could talk more about that here's the second metaphor he uses and that's for recapitulation and that's of a a royal visitation he says you know how it is when some great king enters a large city and dwells in one of its houses right. yeah. because of his dwelling in that house the whole city is honored and enemies and robbers cease to molest it even so it is with the king of all he has come into our country and dwelt in one body amidst the many, and in consequence the designs of the enemy against mankind have been foiled, and the corruption of death which formerly held them in its power has simply ceased to be. I love this imagery for the incarnation. It's like, you know, the king of all has visited our uh, region and thereby honored us and ended the corruption of death. And so people use strong metaphors for the idea of recapitulation in Athanasius. One of the scholars talks about it as like compared to a blood transfusion or uh, you could think of it like an antidote coming into the system that starts to spread throughout, you know. One human body has now been made immortal through union with the divine nature and so that starts to spread to others. It's a really cool set of imagery. Um, and people set that against uh, an Anselmian account or any kind of focus on Christ's death as substitutionary. But, once again, these things are not uh, impossible to uh, hold together. There's this great danger in uh, doing work in the atonement of false dichotomy. Okay? Setting things at odds with one another unnecessarily. And if you give a close reading to On the Incarnation of the Word, what it reveals is a very multifaceted doctrine of salvation in Athanasius's thinking. For example, right after the famous statement of God became man so that man might become God, in a less famous statement, but right after he says, such and so many are the Savior's achievements that follow from his incarnation, that to try to number them is like gazing at the open sea and trying to count the waves. This is the whole structure of uh, on the incarnation is giving multiple reasons for the incarnation in chapter multifaceted doctrine of salvation in Athanasius's thinking for example right after the famous statement of God became man so that man might become God in a less famous statement but right after he says such and so many are the Savior's achievements that follow from his incarnation that to try to number them is like gazing at the open sea and trying to count the waves this is the whole structure of uh, 
on the Incarnation. He's giving multiple reasons for the Incarnation. In chapters 2 and 3, he talks a lot about the doctrine of creation. He gets into recapitulation a lot. But then chapter 4, as I'll show in just a second, he's basically saying, oh, but there's other reasons for the Incarnation, too, that have to do with Christ's death. And, uh, by the way, Anselm has a similar warning. Anselm is saying, don't be overly reductive in your thinking about the atonement. It's really easy to set one thing against another. There can be multiple reasons for it. So in one of his later works, after he's written Cur Deus Homo, a book called On the Virginal Conception and On Original Sin, he'll say, there can be another ex explanation besides the one I offered in Cur Deus Homo for how God took a sinless human being out of the sinful mass of the human race. After all, nothing prohibits there being a plurality of reasons for one and the same thing, any one of which can be sufficient in itself. That's if... If con I'll make a strong statement here. If contemporary theologies of the atonement would just listen to that second statement in Anselm that I just quoted, there can be multiple reasons for one event. We'd stay out of a lot of trouble, and that's what I talk about with Narnia, where you know, everyone's saying, oh, it's Christus Victor in Narnia, but there's the whole thing of the emperor deep magic. And it's like, well, that seems like it's there's more going on than just Edmund's being saved from the witch. So anyway, <laughs> my, my congregation always makes fun of me for uh, quoting C.S. Lewis all the time in my sermons, and so now I'm rising up, even in my YouTube videos, I'm quoting C.S. Lewis all the time. But anyway, so the idea here is there's multiple reasons for the Incarnation, and that's explicit in Athanasius, and that actually makes sense when you think about it. After all, we have multiple needs. So atonement as affecting a union and reconciliation between God and human beings, obviously is going to be a multifaceted God issue. Damn it. A, a complex problem doesn't have a, a simple solution. We have multiple needs. We have need for forgiveness, but we also have a need for a resurrection body. And then there's Satan who needs to be destroyed. You know, there's a lot of things that need to happen, and Christ does all of that. So we're trying to see the full picture here. So here's how uh, Athanasius does it. Uh, he, this comes out in chapter 4 of On the Incarnation, where basically he's saying, oh, there's other purposes, and here's how he puts it. But beyond all this, there was a debt owing which needs to be paid for, as I've said before, all men were due to die. Hence, then, is, or excuse me, here then is the second reason why the word dwelt among us. Namely, that having proved his Godhead by his works, he might offer the sacrifice on behalf of all, surrendering his own temple to death in place of all, to settle man's account with death and free him from the primal transgression. So here we have clearly substitutionary language. This is explicitly substitutionary for Christ's death. On behalf of all, in place of all, combined with sacrificial and legal imagery to interpret that act of substitution. There's the debt that needed to be paid, there's settling man's account, etc. And this is where with An Athanasius, just as with Anselm, uh, Christ's crucifixion constitutes the satisfaction of our debt to God as sinful human beings. So the mechanism for atonement in Athanasius is not just a blood transfer, or a transfusion, or antidote, or you know, portrait redrawn. It's not just the union of human and divine natures. It's um, that in that union, the human nature is destroyed and then resurrected. So you have to look at the incarnation, but also the events of Christ's incarnate life. It's, it's, you can't get over-focused, you know? So uh, there's lots of passages where I draw this out and talk more about it. Um, you can see both recapitulation and satisfaction themes together in Athanasius, both in on the incarnation as well as in other works like his discourses against the Arians. Uh, he'll talk about Christ's death as an offering, as a sacrifice, as a ransom, as a substitute, as an exchange. He'll quote Galatians 3.13 about Christ becoming a curse for us. He'll say things like Christ endured death for us. The death of the incarnate Logos is a ransom for the sins of men. The Lord offered for our sakes the one death. Formerly the world as guilty was under the judgment from the, under judgment from the law, but now the word has taken on himself the judgment and having suffered in the body for all has bestowed on salvation, uh, has bestowed salvation to all. So you can see and he has a strong emphasis interestingly on Christ's ascension as well and his work now as our ambassador in heaven. So here's where we can sum it up. 
if you're if you've gotten bored, we're bringing it back to the point. That here's the basic idea. Arguably the most influential uh, exposition of a satisfaction motif of the atonement in all of church history, Anselm, repeatedly affirms recapitulation in terms that are remarkably similar to Irenaeus and Athanasius. Meanwhile, uh, in fact, he, he even more than that, Anselm even casts satisfaction as serving the larger end of recapitulation because in the Curdeus Homo, the question that sets it all up is how do we get back to blessed immortality? You know, at, at the Garden of Eden, we lost blessed immortality. We lost uh, happiness in God. How do we get back to that? So satisfaction is serving this larger end of the restoration of humanity to her original goal. Okay? So you've got that. You get, in satisfaction, you've got recapitulation. On the other hand, with Athanasius and Irenaeus, as they're articulating a recapitulation account, they're also pausing to say, oh, by the way, there's multiple reasons for this, and Christ's atoning death on the cross also pays the debt of human sin. And that's satisfaction theory. It restores, it pays to God the debt that we owed. So, um, as much as you find these different themes pitted against it against one another, they're actually harmonious, they can fit together well. So that leads to the final question as we start to land the plane here. How might we affirm a doctrine of the atonement today that holds together these two emphases, recapitulation and satisfaction? What might that look like? So let me speak to some concluding uh, worries that some people have here, and this is where we'll get into the transfiguration. A lot of people have a worry about recapitulation. First of all, some people worry that that means universalism. That's simply a misunderstanding. Uh, Christ is the second Adam, so only those who are in Christ partake of the benefits of his. I mean, you could be a universalist, but it, it doesn't lead to that, okay? So that's one thing. Um, other people are just, this feels very uncomfortable to think about recapitulation. It seems weird. You know, um, it seems like it's making, people usually aren't accustomed to thinking of the birth of Christ as itself redemptive in some way. But when you think about it, it actually makes a lot of sense. The incarnation, as we said earlier, is the, the second great fundamental change in reality. Okay? You've got two basic things now, that happen. Now, fuck up and try to say you're fucking working. I'll stick my dick of that room. You've got creation. Now there's two things God and something else. Before that, you just had God. Okay? After creation, then the next big change is incarnation. Now those two things now, are united. Now, fuck up and take that poem. Divine and human nature are united in the incarnation. Jesus on, is both God and, and man in one poem, person. Son of a bitch. That's. There's nothing like that's unprecedented. You know, it's, it's as unprecedented as creation was. If that has you happened, if God has united human shit. and divine nature, don't you think it's not crazy to think that you that's going to dramatically change human nature? How could it not? Now, fucker. And then you know, another point of to support that is that this is very Pauline. I'll put up some verses in First Corinthians 15 where you see Paul has this idea. Suck my there's these slut. two different kinds of humanity. There's the first one and the second one. There's the man of dust and there's the man of heaven. And Christ's resurrection body is the first fruits for our resurrection. Suck but then in Romans 8, slut. creation will be caught up into that. Creation Romans Suck 21 will dick, obtain bitch. to the glory of the children of God. So Somebody Suck might say, well, bitch. yeah, okay, fine. Christ's resurrection is recapitulative, but not his incarnation. Now, here is where things get really fascinating. Because it makes you ask the question, what's the relationship between Christ's resurrection and Christ's incarnation? It's true that the kind of crucial change is triggered on Easter morning, but Christ's resurrection was not an arbitrary event. How could human flesh stay dead once it has been united hypostatically to God? Uh, this is what I argue in the book, is that we you have to see Christ's resurrection within the narrative sweep of the incarnation. It's a kind of has a kind of organic relationship to what comes before. This is the man of heaven who's come. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. How could he stay dead once he's once the divine word has been united to human nature? And I talk a lot about from Thomas Torrance, you know, Christ being uh, life itself, Christ, Christ is God. Christ is life. So uh, 
you know, you think of Lewis's category, deeper magic from before the dawn of time. We have to look at Easter morning and say, this is not some arbitrary stunt that just happened. This is logically and organically an outflow of who Jesus is. Now, somebody might say, I don't know, that sounds a little odd. Here's where the transfiguration comes in. God damn it. And I beg for your patience in thinking about this because some people find this really weird. God Especially Protestants. Catholics get this better than Protestants. There's a great section in the Catechism of the Catholic Church on Christ's transfiguration. Well, it observes so that this is the second time in Christ's life where there's a divine voice of approval. First at his baptism, second at his transfiguration. The one at his baptism initiates his ministry. The one at his transfiguration initiates his passion. So there's this kind of symmetry. Um, and it's drawing that from Thomas Aquinas, who himself was drawing that from the church fathers. Christ's transfiguration is a really fascinating and intriguing and, and significant and neglected event. I'll put up a painting of this event. This is where Jesus goes up on a, a mountain with James, Peter, and John, the inner three, and it says, he was transfigured before them and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And then Moses and Elijah appear and they're talking with Jesus. So the simple question that comes up I here got is, myself hey, where whore. is this light coming from? Uh, how do we understand that? And you could maybe think of just three broad up. answers to that question. The first way is you could just simply interpret you, the transfiguration sir, as God the Father's bestowal of glory and favor upon Jesus. It's kind of shining glory down onto Jesus, such that he God could do that to a non-divine figure too, maybe like Moses's face lighting up. You know. The second, you could just simply interpret the transfiguration as. God the Father's bestowal of glory and favor upon Jesus. It's kind of shining glory down onto Jesus. God damn it. Such that he, God could do that to a non-divine figure too, maybe. Like Moses' face lighting up, you know. A second way you could understand it is as a kind of proleptic anticipation of Easter. You could say this, you know, God is supernaturally bestowing upon Christ what will happen. It's kind of revelatory of the future. But the episode, the, I, th I think it's better to take this episode as more of a revelation of who Jesus is. No. Right? Well, because well, I you have the divine what said interpretation that, uh, offered, the, the divine voice Jesus, saying, this uh, is my son. And, and most strikingly, you have uh, all these uh, connection, biblical uh, theological connections uh, to Old Testament theophanies, the cloud, the fact that it takes place on a mountain, the fact that Moses and Elijah appear, and I go into that a little more in the book, but basically it looks like this is a revelation of Jesus. And this would be the third way to take it, is that it's not the bestowing down onto Jesus something from God the Father only. The, the, you could, you could, this third interpretation doesn't preclude the first two from also being true. You can see, you can say, yes, it is also the Father's giving approval to Jesus, and yes, it is also an anticipation of Easter, but fundamentally, you'd say, what? it's a revelation of who Jesus is. It's a pulling back of the curtain to see who this man is, namely, the Lord right. God. Well. He is. In glory. So! It's the white clothes are telling you. You know, this is so interesting. Um, we're accustomed to think of the transfiguration as an unusual moment in the life of Christ that needs to be... Damn, I stuck my How was he shining? Blood. And all the other moments in his incarnate life prior to resurrection as the normal ones. But in a sense, you might want to flip that and say, no, 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 no. This is the clearest window you have into who this man is. This is, where, this is where God says, this is my son. All the other moments are the ones that need explanation of why aren't his cl clothes shining? Because he's God, you know? And uh, so, uh, when Peter refers to this event in Second Peter 1.16, he says, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that word his refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this makes sense. You know, the Hebrews 1.3 says, Christ is the radiance of the glory of God. Now, this does get a little tricky because I'm not saying that there's no change that happens at the resurrection. I'm saying there's an organic continuity. It's the organic outgrowth of who Jesus already was. So this is a little nuanced here. Let me share how Thomas Aquinas puts it. This is a long tradition of thought, of thinking of Christ's incarnate life prior to his resurrection as this kind of hidden mystery, you know. And Thomas talks about, he distinguishes uh, Christ's possession 
of a glorified body, which he gets it on Easter morning, from what happens here. So they're not the same thing. Nonetheless, he interprets the transfiguration as a revelation of who Jesus really is. He says the clarity of Christ's body in his transfiguration was derived from his Godhead and from the glory of his soul. And for the question of, well, then why isn't he always shining? Why doesn't he always have white clothes? Thomas says that the glory of his soul did not overflow into his body from the first moment of Christ's conception was due to a certain divine dispensation that he might fulfill the mysteries of our redemption in a passable body. This did not, however, deprive Christ of his power of, out, of outpouring the glory of his soul into his body. So note that there it's Christ's power. This is not some alien imposition onto Jesus. This is who Jesus really is. He is the Lord God. And, uh, you know, I want to be careful here not to overstate this point. Nonetheless, if the, rev if the transfiguration is in some sense revelatory, then we can say there's something unique about Jesus' physical body even before the resurrection, because there's been the union of divine and human nature. And so there's organic continuity between uh, Bethlehem and Easter. Uh, the empty tomb, what happens at the empty tomb, is connected to what happens at the manger. Um, it's not just this arbitrary event on Easter morning. Okay. So, let's sum it all up. What is yielded by all of this? If we're right that there's recapitulation and that we can see that as harmonious with an emphasis upon Christ's death as satisfying divine honor and even, as I would say, as propitiating God's wrath. I haven't talked about propitiation very much in the book I do, but I think that's a biblical concept. I think divine wrath is very clearly a biblical reality that needs to be solved. And it seems as though from the Old Testament precursors like the Day of Atonement ritual in Leviticus 16, as well as various expositions of Christ's death, like Isaiah 53 or Romans 3, 21 to 26, it does seem as though Christ's death, among other things, propitiates God's wrath. So what we're saying here is we can affirm that and recapitulation. It's harmonious, and it can all fit together. And so the, the ultimate upshot of all of this is that we can have a more comprehensive and holistic view of the atonement by... Uh, drawing from these various different theological emphases, from these historical theologians, from these different motifs. Yeah, cutting off your right ear, you stupid Again, that's not too shocking because the atonement is dealing with a complicated uh, set of problems. There's multiple problems that need to be solved. There's the problem of the problem of, stupid the problem of God's wrath, the problem of the robbing of God of honor, the problem of Satan. You know, and all that needs to be solved, and, and other things as well. So if we want to say, step back and say, okay, is there a way, is there a term that we can see as kind of um, the heading of it all? Like, is there anything that holds God recapitulation God and satisfaction together? God and I would like to propose the word substitution, which is intrinsic to them both God and can be seen to hold them together. There's the mechanism of self-substitution by which Christ both restores humanity through his life and uh, bears divine judgment through his death. Okay, And uh, the way I like to put this is uh, actually a very simple, popular level way that Tim Keller puts it in lots of his sermons is Christ lived the life we should have lived and he died the death we should have died. Now those are two different kinds of substitution. So sometimes they're called strict substitution versus inclusive substitution. Sometimes they're called representation versus replacement. So you can use the adjective in him or the prepositional phrase in him for the one and the and for us or in our place for the other. But they're so it's a little different how the substitution is working, but they're both substitutionary. Christ stands in our place in both cases. There is life that is restorative and his death that is propitiating. So uh, that's maybe a way we can envision it as hanging together. And uh, what we're trying to do here is emphasize the whole narrative arc of all that Christ has done and the whole of its effects, God but not flatten everything out either. So we can still recognize that um, there's kind of a climactic moment uh, at, at the cross. And we can still affirm a penal element to salvation. So again, we can affirm penal substitution. We would just say substitution is the broader wraparound category. Um, the way I put it in the book is 
all that is penal is substitutionary, but not all that is substitutionary is penal. Substitution is the bigger category, and it incorporates Christ's active obedience as our federal head and covenant representative his entire earthly life. And so, um, in this way, you can see the cross and resurrection as this climactic moment in this larger uh, exchange uh, uh, that is happening. Christ's solidarity with his people is kind of climactically enacted there. But, it, you know, if you try to have a hard cutoff between Christ's life and Christ's death, as though they're absolutely different, you have to say, well, where's the cutoff point? Is it in the Garden of Gethsemane? Something seems to be happening there. Is it, you know, the trial uh, before Pilate? Uh, is it carrying the cross? Is it the actual moment where the uh, nails go into his wrists and feet and so forth? And it seems kind of arbitrary, you know, to, to divorce the two. It, it, it seems like more there's this organic process, this narrative process. And that's what we ultimately get to. And that enables us to appreciate all that Christ has done in all his details. So for our doctrine of the atonement, it's important. And I, I'm not trying to overcorrect here as though nobody else is saying this or, or something like that. But it's just one. This is just one way of envisioning God, it. Fucking but then we're able to say, you know, in, in, in our doctrine of the atonement, it's important that Christ develops in the womb and goes through infancy, not just beams down as a 10-year-old and grows from there. It's important that he has his public ministry and the kind of escalating conflict with the religious establishment of the day, as opposed to, you know, goes and he's a solitary monk uh, or hermit and he just comes back and gets crucified all of a sudden. It's important that he's crucified and not stoned, for example. It's important that he actually has to die on the cross rather than just suffering for some period of time and then immediately passing into glory. And it's important that he be buried. So there's actually an interval of time between his death and his resurrection. And there's lots we could go into there. Um, and then you've got all this ascended work and his resurrected work, the 40 days between Easter and Pentecost. And then you've got uh, his ascension. And then you've got his ascended work and his second coming. And all we're going to see the full narrative arc because all of it is important. And uh, seeing the full narrative arc is not in competition with an emphasis upon his death and resurrection as the kind of climactic moment in that larger process. So, there, there it is. Uh, hopefully that's helpful for people who are interested in the doctrine of the atonement. I find this a fascinating area, and I'd like to put forward that proposal of drawing from Irenaeus and Anselm uh, with dialogue with other important uh, testimonies such as Athanasius as one way of envisioning a kind of lowercase c Catholic core to the doctrine of the atonement that we can kind of put at the center even as we keep working on all other details and other nuances. So let me know what you think about that. I'll, I'll end it with one final comment and that is that in all of our discussion of this, we are trying to be accurate and clear, but we recognize our words fall short of fully exhausting the truth that they refer to, and there is mystery involved in the atonement. The way G.I. Packer puts it is he says that we're trying to expostulate the meaning of the atonement, not its exact mechanics. We don't fully see through and see all the details of it, you know? And that's helpful. Um, and also, we, all, we also can't drain the offensiveness of it. We're trying to account for it, but we can't fully, you know, no interpretation can possibly um, be more earth-shattering than the actual occurrence of this. If you think God incarnate being crucified, you know? And so to that end, let me conclude as I conclude the chapter in the book with this amazing quote from James Denny about the power of the atonement. He says, if the atonement is anything to the mind, it is everything. It is the most profound of all truths and the most recreative. It determines more than anything else our conceptions of God, of man, of history, and even of nature. The atonement is a reality of such a sort that it can make no compromise. The man who fights it knows he is fighting for his life and puts all his strength into the battle. The surrender is literally to give up himself, to cease to be the man he is, and to become another man. The cross of Christ is man's own glory, or it is his final stumbling block. Powerful words, and it is wonderful to think about when we consider 
the amazing salvation Jesus Christ has worked for us. It really is. There's no, it's like, uh, you know, you're getting into it and you realize if, if, if this is real, it will change everything about me. <laughs> the stakes are literally infinite. But that's happy news if we can humble ourselves under it. So I uh, hope that was helpful for people or at least interesting. I tried to get through a lot of material quickly. Sorry if I'm talking too fast or, or scatterbrained in the process. Sometimes I watch my own videos and I'm like, oh, you know, <laughs> I'm talking in weird ways, but I'm just trying to make it as accessible as possible. If you would like the video, that helps. If you subscribe to the channel, that helps. If you'd like to become a patron, that'd be super awesome but never any pressure for that that's just uh you just know that i do appreciate all that and uh let me know what you think in the comments and we'll keep the dialogue going if you're interested in other things on the atonement i'll do some other things but i also want to do my next few videos will be on triage i'm going to do one on eschatology what are the things that we should that are the central and the doctrine of the last things one on baptism and uh, a few others, one on complementarian versus egalitarian issues. So those videos I, I uh, hope could be helpful for people. So those will be the next few videos. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. God bless. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to shit in my pants. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God fuck it. Let's hope you miss it. God damn it. Now I'm gonna go shit. You see, that fucking pisses me off.
The Jackson Brothers sent in. The Jackson Brothers. The Jackson Brothers sent in. The Jackson Brothers sent in. I'm gonna be a poor sport and get me something to eat. Make him wait. <laughs> this guy, I'm, I'm pissed off about that shit. I'm getting, I'm gonna get me something to fucking eat. And fuck this shit up.
Suck my dick, bitch. Shit. Come on, you goddamn motherfucker. You goddamn mother... You goddamn motherfucker. Goddamn. Slut. Suck my slut. Suck my motherfucking dick, you cunt. Now fuck up and take that fucking poem. You slant-eyed whore from China. Suck my motherfucking dick, you motherfucking bitch. Suck my slut. Suck my dick, bitch. Jackson, suck my dick. Marie said <laughs> on the bus. Either I was in first or second grade. I think I was in first grade. I'm not sure. And then I saw written on the bathroom wall, Terry sucks. <laughs> Terry suck my dick. Maurice needs to learn to keep his dick at Maurice needs to learn to keep his dick at to Maurice needs to learn to keep his dick to herself. Maurice needs to learn how Maurice needs to learn to keep his dick to himself. Dick Dick Move you slant that goddamn whore from China. Move you whore. Oh, I'll put your god shit and fucking black ass for stalling, even if you are white. Let me get my goddamn baked potato. Let me get my motherfucking baked potato. Motherfucking baked potato.
suck my dick, bitch. Let's see if this motherfucker's moved me yet. Let's see if this motherfucker's moved me yet. He's bringing out that whore. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. Come on, you skank slut. <laughs> Stupid fucker. <laughs> you bitch. Now fuck up and take that goddamn poem. You goddamn son of a goddamn bitch. Suck my dick, bitch. Suck my motherfucking slut. Suck my slut. Suck my slut. Now fuck up and overlook this. And take that fucking home. God damn it.
God fucking damn this this really fucking pissing me off. God damn it, I'm getting fucking shit all over my fucking... God damn it. Now fuck up and over. Now fuck up and overlook this and bring that fucking pole down here. You slut. Let me get my other spoon.
<laughs> Sucker, you fell for that like a sack of tons of bricks of shit. He's one way in a ton worth of fucking shit, son of a bitch. Shit. Cause you fucked up. Cause you just fucked up. <laughs> fucking bitch. Fucking cunt. You, my dear sir, have just fucked up. Come on, you slut. Come on, you whore. You whore. She's a whore. Come on, you bloody whore from China. You bloody whore. You whore. You whore. Whore. Cause you just fucked up big time. You fucking slut from China. You just fucked up. You, my dear sir, have just fucked up. Let's get rid of that fucking poem. Suck my motherfucking slut. Suck my fucking slut. <clears throat> Suck my slut. Suck my motherfucking slut. <laughs> Bitch. Suck my slut. Suck my motherfucking slut. <laughs> I'm fucking you up. I'm, I'm fucking you up. My motherfucking slut.
Well, get ready to kiss that fucking poem goodbye, slut. Suck my slut. <laughs> oh, cuz you just fucked up. You, my dear sir, have just fucked up. Ah! <laughs> I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave with neither peace nor pawn. I fucked his hole. Oh! You see that dick of mine hanging out of his fucking mouth, puking cum. Both that dick and his fucking mouth. That's from where I fucked him up the butt. And my dick went into his gut, migrated up his fucking stock books. Came out of his fucking throat and then, then, and then out of his fucking mouth, puking cum. Fucking bitch. Fucking bitch. Shit. God damn it. You see, now that fucking pisses me off. Don't even think about it, you slant-eyed slut. He's being like that goddamn whore. God damn it. He's, I done fucked up. I done fucked up. I done fucked up. I fucked up. I fucked up. I done fucked up. God damn it. God fucking damn it. God damn it. God fucking damn it. Sociology 101. Today we're going to follow up from the video that I recently produced with um, my mentoring professor from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Dr. Adam Harwood. Many of you may remember that have been tuning in regularly. We went over his systematic theology, um, the biblical, historical, and systematic, and uh, highly recommend the systematic if you're looking for one that is written by a 
uh, non-Calvinist, if you will, uh, scholar, but he includes, as he uh, told us, um, you know, teachings from a wide array of Christian history in order to educate versus indoctrinate. And uh, on page, let me pull it up, 589, this there's so a table there, table 23-1, that, um, that you can actually see more clearly because it's uh, put here on the screen for us, where it goes through the word predestined, or perizzo in the original language. Um, so let me uh, add this to the screen so you can see this. And he, he lists all uh, six times that the word perizzo, predestination, is used in the New Testament and gives a, a summary of what each of those are meaning. And I God thought, well, that's a it. great episode for us to examine, do a word study, if you will, of all the, the New Testament uses of the word predestined and see if those words uh, correlate to what the Calvinists teach. Because as we know, God uh, and we've it. talked about here many times, is Calvinists often take the word predestination uh, to mean ultimately that God has predetermined before the world begins who will and won't believe so as to be saved. And so it seems to me that if that is what predestination actually means, then there should be at least one verse that actually says that, that gives us that indication contextually that God is predestined for certain people to be believers. Um, he is somehow effectually causing certain people to be believers. Everybody's born effectually unable to believe. In other words, they don't have any control over their inability to believe the gospel. They're born that way by divine decree on Calvinism, unless God intervenes in some supernatural way, causing them to believe. That is the essence of Calvinism. And they're using the term predestination to support this concept that God is ultimately predestined whether you will go to heaven or hell before you're ever even created. Um, that is the crux of the Calvinistic system. And we are looking at, by doing a word study, the word predestination in the original languages and saying, okay, do any of these verses actually say that? God damn it. And we're going to look at each one of them in particular and be as fair as we possibly can be. Um, I, I know you, you may be watching this. Well, how can you possibly be fair? You're obviously the anti-Calvinist Leighton Flowers. Yes, well, I, I was a Calvinist for 10 years for a reason. And because I read these texts with the premise of Calvinism in full view, with the interpretation of predestination like a Calvinist. And, and to be fair and to be objective, you've got to back away and you've got to ask yourself the question, what do these texts mean in their original context? What is this word, perizzo, in the original language? Uh, predestination, what does it actually mean? Uh, and, and how are we to understand it? And so that's why we're going to go through each one of these texts in order to do that. So let's start with Acts chapter 4, verse 28, and looking at the word predestination. Um, Adam Harwood's uh, conclusion is that ultimately this word is teaching that God has predestined the cross of Christ. Now, can we all agree with that? <laughs> Any Calvinist on the side chat? Anybody listening who's a Calvinist as well? Uh, I think we can all agree that God predestined, predetermined, if you will, decided beforehand that the cross of Christ would come to pass. That, that, that God would send his son uh, not only to become incarnate, but to ultimately die a death on the cross for the payment of the sins of the world. I think we can all agree that God has predestined the cross of Christ, but let's look at the verse in its original context because that's what we're doing here, word study. So let's look at the word, beginning verse 27, for surely this city there were gathered together against you, holy, your holy servant, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of, peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And so here's where the word perizzo is used in the original language, the word predestined, is it, does it have anything to do with God predestining people to be believers? No. So, so far, and I don't think Calvinists would claim that, by the way, but I'm just, remember, that's the standard that we're looking for for any of these verses. And I'm not saying that Calvinists are trying to say that this verse teaches predestination with regard to salvation. Um, what I'm saying is we're going to look at each one of these verses to see if any of them meet that standard. And I don't think that any of them do for obvious reasons we're going to look at. But I, I want to highlight this, this particular passage because it does show us something that sometimes Calvinists don't understand about provisionists. We do believe God predestines things. Okay? Just because we don't believe in determinism doesn't mean we don't believe that God determines things. Of course God's, God determines things. God has 
the ability of self-determination to make choices, to do things, to accomplish his will and his purposes. We don't believe that free will is a superpower that thwarts the will of God. And so God does what he pleases. Um, this is one of the reasons that I wrote the uh, article years ago, Does Calvary Prove Divine Determinism? Because some Calvinists, like John Piper, we've played him before, and others, actually use Acts chapter 4 to, to demonstrate how God is good while predetermining evil. And this is sometimes the text that Calvinists will use to say ultimately, well, you know, look at what God did to predetermine the cross. The worst evil of all times in, 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 in that, in that these, these people killed Jesus. And Jesus is perfect, and, and he's an innocent human being. What, what worse evil is there than to kill the Son, of, the Son of God? And yet God predetermined it. Thus, this proves that God can predetermine evil um, and, and still not be guilty for it. And therefore, that gives them the underlying philosophical basis and the, the moral basis by which to say God predetermines all evil. And, and we just push back on that for, for obvious reasons. And so let me go over that just real quickly. Uh, by reading this article. John Piper and many other Calvinists appealed to God's work to ensure Calvary, as seen in Acts 4 that we just read, as a proof text for divine de determinism, or at least to give uh, credence to divine determinism. In other words, to give the moral uh, underpinning for divine determinism. If, I, I, if we can prove that God even determined one evil event, and that somehow gives us the, the ability to say that God can justly predetermine all evil events uh, without being held culpable for doing so. But does citing examples of events that God has worked to bring about prove God brings about all events in this manner? If so, there are some significant issues that need to be addressed. It's a question for my Calvinistic friends. When we object to the concept of divine determinism, God's sovereign work to bring about all things whatsoever that come to pass, and you appeal to the crucifixion as your proof that God brings about all moral evil, are you saying that God is sovereignly working so as to redeem the very sins that he sovereignly worked to bring about? Let me ask that question again. Are you trying to argue, ultimately, that God is working to redeem the sins that he sovereignly brought to pass by his sovereign decree? Is Calvary just about God cleaning up his own mess, so to speak, redeeming his own determinations? So he determines the sins of the murderers, but he brings about the means by which those very sins You better sins swap were wars, bitch, or I'm going to put your black ass in checkmate. Appealing to God's sovereignty to ensure my the slut, you stupid sin, right? bitch. So it's to prove that God sovereignly works to bring about all the sins of the the self-defeating market. It would be tantamount to arguing that because a police department set up a sting on the to catch a notorious drug dealer, the police department is responsible for every single intention and action of all drug dealers at all times. Proof that the police department is secret to the identities. Okay, last game, when we jog list, ban in the board, or one of the future rematch, I just quit. That the drug dealer would do what they out. wanted him to do, sell drugs at a particular moment. In time. Okay, last game, the police are the only way responsible for all that drug dealer has done and ever will do. We celebrate and reward the actions of this police department because they are working to stop the drug activity, not because they are secretly causing all of it so as to stop some of it. Teaching that God brings about all sin based upon how he brought about Calvary is like teaching that the police officer brings about every drug deal based upon how he brought about one sting operation. Yes, at times the scriptures do speak of God hardening men's hearts. Examples like Exodus 7 or Romans 9. Blinding them with a the spirit of stupor, as we see in Romans 11, 8. Demanding their healing by use of parabolic uh, language, like we see in Mark 4 or Matthew 13 or Matthew 16. And he always does so for a redemptive good. But the reason such passages stand out so distinctly from the rest of scripture is because of their uniqueness. If God worked this way in every instance, these texts would make no sense. After all, what is there for God to harden, provoke, or restrain if not the autonomous will of creatures? In other words, if God is solemnly decreeing every choice and every desire that everybody makes, then what is the purpose in stepping in, intervening to harden a heart? Or to restrain evil. What do you or restrain to touch your head? I decree them to do evil and then I restrain them from doing the evil. That doesn't make any sense. The, the intervention of God proves free will. It, it demonstrates free will. It doesn't disprove it, as sometimes Calvinists seem to think. If everything is under the meticulous control of God's sovereign work, what is left to permit and or restrain is of that which he's already controlling? Is God merely restraining something that he previously determined? Why blind eyes from seeing something that were naturally predetermined not to see? 
Why put a parabolic blindfold on a corpse like that sinner incapable of seeing spiritual truth? These are questions that many, not all, but many Calvinists seem unwilling to entertain at any depth. And that's why we're pushing back on this. So, going back to Acts chapter 4, we do believe God predestined some things. We don't believe that he had to predestine the cross by making Pontius Pilate evil. By decreeing that Herod would be an evil man from birth and couldn't do otherwise. No. We believe that he knows Herod's heart. He knows the heart of Judas. He knows the heart of Pilate. He knows the hearts of the Gentile peoples of that day. He knows the hearts of the Romans at that day. He uses them in their already rebellious condition. He blinds them from the truth so as to bring about his purpose and his plan through their evil intentions. So God, you don't need omnidetermanism to bring about the predestination of Calvary. Uh, you don't. You, in other words, it doesn't prove anything uh, to to suggest that God predetermined one event that has evil involved. And just because God determines an event that is evil doesn't mean that He ultimately causes the evil intentions of the actors involved. Let me let me say that again. Just because God predetermines an evil event that takes place does not mean that God caused the pride and the lust of those involved in that event. The selling of Joseph into slavery by the brothers is often an example of this. God does not have to cause, predetermine the pride and the lust of the brothers in order to ensure that that event takes place. He can simply know it and use the circumstances for his own benefit, which is exactly what our theodicy would say, that God uses the free will creature's choices, knowing what they are in the given circumstances, to bring about his purpose and his plan. You don't need omnideterminism to get to that point. That's why we're pushing back. So let's go now to the next verse that we see in Romans 8, 29, and 30. So it's used twice right next to each other in verses 29 and 30. Again, the word predestination. And here's Adam Harwood's conclusion based upon what the text actually says, and we're going to look at it. Believers are predestined to be like Jesus. That's what verse 29 says, that believers are predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. Suck That's all dick, that verse bitch. 29 says. Verse 30 goes on to say that believers are predestined, who are predestined to be like Jesus, they are called, they're justified, and they're glorified. So those who believers who are predestined to become like Jesus, they're also predestined to be called, justified, and glorified. Because that's what he does for believers. This is how God brings about his purpose and his plan. Um, and so let's look at those passages. By the way, there is an article also on Romans 8, and my interpretation of Romans 8, 29 and following there at Sociology 101 if you want to look at that. Um, so, you know, feel free to, to, to go there and to, to look at it in its entirety. It's also in my book, um, the, the Potter's Promise. If you're interested in looking at a more detailed uh, outline or uh, investigation of Romans 8, um, but right now I'm just giving an overview uh, using uh, just a, a focus on the word predestined. And so, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined Pre he, so he predestined people to be believers? Does it say that? No. What does it say? He predestined them to be conformed into the image of his son. That's sanctification. So who is he predestined to what? We'll look back up in verse um, 28. We know that for those who love God, so he's talking about who? Believers. Those who love God. She gets me all of easy spit. Spit, 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 spit. Oozy, oozy spit.
God, dick, bitch. Suck my slut. She's cute. No, she's not. She's adorable. I wish I could touch her head in real life. She's so damn cute. Touch her head and we're love. She's so damn cute. Now fuck up and move this rook right here. God fucking damn it. Come on, you slut. Man, this is fucked up. Man, I man, I just fucked up. God fucking damn it. Suck my dick, bitch. Man, I should I should have taken that fucking knight. Now I should have taken that fucking pawn. God fucking damn it. God fucking damn it. Damn it. Come on, you bitch. God fuck it. Okay, let. Okay. I, I've got my ass fucked, so fuck this shit.